So in this lesson, let's focus on our game's coin. In particular, its movement when we interact with a coin. Let's go ahead and try out the game and see what happens right now. I'll go ahead and press play scene and I'll navigate my little character around and collect a coin. And as you can see, well, it just vanishes. Typically in a game though, when you interact with an object in that game, the object that's interactive really should be animated when you interact with it to emphasize that interaction in the game. Often an object that's collected will do a little bounce animation. Often a sound will play when a collectible object is collected. So in this lesson, we're gonna focus on animation. We're gonna make the coin bounce when it's collected. This will be the first time in this course that we've actually talked about keyframed animation using a timeline right inside of Godot. Lastly, I'll be showing you how to actually turn off and on those collision layers and masks, but this time using code, because when we collect a coin and it plays an animation, during that time that an animation is being played, we don't want the character to be able to interact with that coin multiple times as that animation is playing. So when we collect a coin, we should start the animation playing of the coin bouncing, but turn off the coin's interactivity because that initial collection has already happened. Let's go ahead and jump in. What I'll do here is focus in on my coin object and I'm gonna select that coin. Now, if you've made multiple instances of the coin in your game level, it doesn't matter because we're gonna go into the original coin scene. So once we make one coin plane animation, they all should work. Let's go ahead and press that little clapboard icon to jump over into the coin scene. And I'll select the root node of my coin and I'm gonna add into my scene as a child of that root node, a node that we haven't talked about yet in this course. And that is an animation player node. It's right here. Of course you can search for it, but I'll just go ahead and double click on it. When you add an animation player node into a scene, you can then animate pretty much any property of any other node in that scene on a timeline. You'll notice that when I added the animation player into my scene, that it actually switched us over into a new kind of dock at the bottom of the Godot editor called the animation dock. This is our timeline essentially. With an animation player node selected, I can go to this animation button, which is actually a menu, and I can create a new animation. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And when I do that, I'm gonna name the animation of the coin bouncing, well, bounce. It's important that you name animations in a sensical way. I suggest using all lowercase letters and no spaces and no special characters because you'll actually be using this name in code. Okay, so bounce is a good name, all lowercase. I'll press okay. When we do that, we get a timeline and these numbers are seconds. And this little grayed out area here, it's not a great user interface design, I'll admit. The grayed out area is actually the active part of our animation. So our animation is set to have a duration of just one second. Of course, I can use this little magnifying glass slider to zoom in and get more steps or more increments down to one tenth of a second. And we can change that animation length from one second right here if we wanna make it shorter or longer. But how do we actually animate the movement of our coin? In this case, we're actually not gonna animate the entire coin object. We're only gonna animate the mesh instance of our coin inside of the coin scene. We're doing this, we're animating the mesh instance instead of the entire coin, because when we animate in Godot, we're animating coordinates. And if we animate the coordinates of the entire coin object, well, that means that we'll be animating all of the coins in the entire game level and positioning the coins using keyframes in animation but we don't want to do that. We want to be able to position each individual coin in the level wherever we want it to be, which could be anywhere in our game level. But in the coin scene, we're going to make the coin do a little bounce wherever it is in the game level by animating its mesh instance only. So you'll notice that with an animation player node in my scene, and once I've actually created an animation, which we named bounce, if I select any node in my scene, you'll notice now that in the inspector next to any one of these sets of properties, like under transform, you'll notice that next to position for X and Y and Z, there is a little key icon. This is how you make keyframes 
for that type of property. So if you want to animate the coin mesh's uh, position, you would simply press this little key button to make a keyframe where you currently are, where your playhead is, this little blue line on your timeline. What I'm going to do is go to the very beginning of my animation, which is one second long, with my playhead right at zero here. I'm going to press the little position key button. When I do that, it's going to ask me, do you want to create a new track property for position and insert a key? Yes, I do. So I will press create. When I did that, I created a new track, basically a line where we can add keyframes for a particular property of that object. So there is a position line right now, and I have one keyframe, one little diamond, which tells this object where it should be at this time. Now, a coin animation of it bouncing is going to be pretty quick. It's going to be less than a second, actually. In fact, I think after just 0.2 seconds, that coin should already be up a little bit because it'll start bouncing. So I'm going to go to 0.2 seconds into my animation, and I'm going to drag that mesh instance uh, up quite a bit. Now you'll notice that the collision shape is staying here at 000 in my scene, and that's fine. That's the way it should be, but we're animating the mesh instance to go up. So I'm pretty happy with the way that is. Maybe I'll go a little bit higher up. Now I need to tell this mesh instance to be at this location at this time. So I'll press the little key button here to make a new keyframe at 0.2 seconds. If I drag my little playhead by dragging in this gray section here, I can see that animation happening. It starts at the bottom and it goes up. Great. I'm going to make my coin now go down a little bit after it's bounced up and it's going to go down. So at 0.3 seconds, I'm going to move the coin mesh instance 3D a little bit down. And of course, I will press the key button here to make a keyframe of that position at that time. So now I have a little animation that is just 0.3 seconds long with three keyframes. It starts at the bottom and it goes up and then down a little bit. That seems like it's quite fast, but I think it should actually work quite well. What I should do now is actually change my animation length overall to match my actual animation. So this number right here is one for one second. I'm going to change that. I'll type it in here, 0.3 seconds, and I'll press enter. So that gray section there, that gray bar matches the actual duration that I want. Well, I'm going to press control S to save, and I'm going to go into my coins code. Now, please recall that my coin is an area 3D and my area 3D has signals and we've used a signal called body entered, which means that if a physical body enters that area, this collision shape, it will trigger a signal which will run a function in the coins code. So if I double click on this on body entered function, which is being called when that body entered signal is called, well, if I double click on this, it should jump me right into my coins script file where I have the on body entered function deleting the coin using Q free right away. I don't want that to be the case. I don't want the coin to be deleted from the game right when it's collected. Instead, I want to tell this animation player to play that animation called bounce. So I'm going to get rid of this line. I'm going to press delete with it selected, and I'm going to select that animation player node by saying dollar sign animation player, and I'll press enter to auto complete that line. We're selecting this node and animation players have a method built in. So we'll put a dot and we'll call that method. It's called play. You can play an animation with play. Go figure. Play is a method call, so you need round brackets. And in those round brackets, you need to name that animation that you want to play. In this case, bounce. Okay, it needs to be a string with double quotes. Once I've done that, I can press Control S to save. Let's see what happens. If I go back to my level one scene tab and I press play scene, my game will load. And if I go and collect the coin, hey, the coin animation played except the coin's not disappearing anymore. We got rid of that Q free method call. And so the coin is just sitting there at the end of that animation. Okay, so what do we do? 
Well, it turns out, if I go back into my coin scene, that animation players have signals as well for their common events. So essentially what I want to do is not have the coin delete itself right away with a cue free. Instead, we're playing an animation. However, when that animation is over, after 0.3 seconds, I want the coin to then disappear, to then cue free out of the game level. How do I do that? Well, our animation player node, if I select it and go over to the node dock here, there is an animation finished signal, which I'm going to use. So what I'm gonna do here is have my animation player detect when an animation has finished playing after 0.3 seconds, bounce will finish. When that happens, it will emit a signal to a custom function that we're going to have it right. So I'm going to double click on animation finished right here, and I'm going to have it make a new function called on animation player animation finished, and it's going to be on my coin script. That's great. I'm not going to change anything here. I'll press connect. When I do that, it'll make this function right here, of course. And if I select my animation player node, it should show me here that under animation finished, it's connected now to a function. If I double click on that line right there, it should jump me back to my code exactly at that line where there should be this little icon here, okay? When the animation finishes, we're going to call that same queue free method call, which will delete the coin. Great, let's go ahead and do a control S to save and I'll jump back over to my level one scene tab and I will press play scene. When I do that, and I go and collect the coin, the coin bounces and it disappears. So that's it, right? Well, not so fast because when we made that animation play, I'll go back into my 3D workspace and into my coin scene so we can see what's going on here. That collision shape is still sitting there and it's still active which means that if a human player was sneaky, they could go out of the coin after touching the coin and then go back into the coin area, thereby actually collecting two coins from one coin. We don't want that to happen. Let's see if I can quickly demonstrate this. If I go back to my coins code, what I'll do here is when the coin is initially contacted by the player, which is this function right here, on body entered. We're playing the bounce animation. Before that happens, I'm gonna do a simple print out to the screen. This is how we can print out the output doc when we're testing our game in the Godot editor. What I'll do is I'm gonna print out just a little couple of words here, coin collected. And to make this a little bit easier for myself, what I'll do is my animation here, my bounce animation, I'm gonna drag these keyframes out to make my animation quite a lot longer, and then I'll fix them, I'll move them back in a moment. I'm gonna make my animation 1.4 seconds. You don't need to do this. I'm just demonstrating this so we can see how we can fix this problem. Uh, if I save that, Control S, and then go back and play my game, well, my game should have a much slower coin bounce and the coin will take much longer, therefore, to disappear. Let's see if I can actually collect it twice. If I go ahead and play my game and collect the coin and then go back into the coin, you see what happens? I collected my coin twice. I don't want that. I went through it once, I went out of the coin and then back into the coin. That's a bad thing. How do we fix that? Well, the answer lies in what we covered in the last lesson, which is collision layers and collision masks. Have we set up the collision layers and masks for our coin? Let's go back into our coin scene and select the root node of the coin and go over to the inspector and the collision section where we put the coin on layer three, which is the item layer. And we made sure that the coin can detect the player object. What I want to have happen though is when the player touches the coin, I want to turn both of these layers off. I want to take the coin, that particular instance of the coin, out of its own layer so it's on no layer so the player can't find it. I also want to make sure that the coin can't find anything else so I'll turn off its mask as well so it can't find the player. How do we turn off and on these layers and masks using code? Well, of course, there are methods for that. If I go back into my coins script, and I'll minimize my output doc at the bottom, 
when the coin is initially entered by a physics body, when the player first collects the coin, I no longer need this print um, method call here, so I'll get rid of that. Instead, I'm going to call a method called set collision layer value. When I call this method, it requires two parameters or arguments. It requires which layer we want to target and if we want to turn that layer off or on, which is a Boolean value, which means true or false. So what I want to do here is with my coin root node selected, take a look. I want to turn layer three off. So inside of the parentheses here, I'm going to type a three for layer three and put a comma and I will write the word false. I want to turn that layer off. I'm going to do the same thing for this collision mask as well. So on the very next line of code, before we play the bounce animation, I'm going to call that other method called set collision mask value. And this time I'm going to turn off mask one, which means I'm going to set mask one to false. Now, just a note that in older versions of Godot, like Godot 3 and 3.5, these methods were a little bit different. You wouldn't actually type the number that you saw in the box of the layer. You would always type one number less. So if you wanted to target layer three, you would type two. But now in Godot 4, you simply type the number that you see with these new methods. So it is three and one. When I do that and press Control S to save and go back to my level one scene tab and press play scene, if I go ahead and navigate my character over to the coin and go through the coin and back into it, you know what I should actually do here? I should actually put that print back into my code so we can see if I'm actually collecting it multiple times. I'm going to call that print again, and I'm going to say coin collected like that. I'll save it. I'll play my scene. And so now if I collect a coin, I'll go through the coin, out of the coin and back into it. It only collected once it worked. It only collects the coin once, no matter how many times you go through it, because we're disabling its collisions with those two lines of code, uh, these two that we just added. So I think that's it. Very quickly, I will get rid of this print line here. I will go back to my coin scene to the animation player. I'll fix the length 0.2 seconds and 0.3 and I'll change the length of my animation here to 0.3. Just to finish off this lesson, there was one little mistake I made in the last lesson and you'll see it if I play my game. If I go back to my 3D workspace, I have these blocks here floating above my game level and when the game starts, they fall. I actually left one of these blocks off to the side and it just kept falling through my fall zone. I move that block back over my game level. That wasn't the issue. If I press play scene, you'll notice that the blocks over here, well, if I go over to them, they are colliding or crashing with each other. They are overlapping. I don't want that. This is a collision mask and collision layers issue because for each one of those blocks, I'll go to any one of the blocks into its scene. If I select its root node and go over to the collision section, you'll notice that I put the block correctly on layer three, which is the item layer. However, I made the blocks only collide with the player and the ground, they should also collide with each other in my case. So I'll turn on mask three. If I don't do that, they won't know to collide with each other because they can't detect each other because of that issue. So I'll press control S to save and I'll go back to level one and I will press play scene. So now you'll notice that the blocks, well, hopefully they don't collide with each other anymore. But I think that'll be it for this lesson. As always, I'll put the code and what we did up on the screen as best as I can at the end of this lesson. That'll be it for this one, though. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.